This is lecture seven, microbial genetics. And the idea here in this lecture is to show you some important concepts from microbial genetics, um, mostly bacterial stuff. And there's several different kind of vaguely related topics here. Um, we don't go into any one thing in incredible detail, but you will see. So first, there are a couple things I've mentioned um, in the term that we need to, to look at. One, one thing is gene regulation. So um, gene regulation is the question of how, um, how, how much of a protein is made at a given time. When is a specific protein made? When is that gene transcribed? And when is that me messenger RNA translated? Does it happen fast? Does it happen slow, etc.? That's gene regulation, gene expression. If we look over here at um, at a drawing of like a human cell, the size of these arrows is meant to show you how much of the that regulation happens at this step. So transcription, RNA processing, that would be like splicing, capping, that sort of thing. Uh, translation and then post-translational modifications. Um, like phosphorylation, etc. Um, and what we see is that the 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 biggest single step that has um, gene regulation is transcription. So that that's the question of when does a gene get transcribed? Under what conditions does it get transcribed? Um, that's when you're studying, you know, transcriptional regulation of a gene. But humans also have a lot of ways to use all these other steps um, for controlling gene expression. And when you see um, multiple steps in biology, when you see a lot of different steps to do something that might, if it looks unnecessary, probably it's serving some function like allowing greater precision and control. Um, so if we move over to the bacterial side, we see it's kind of a shorter path because bacteria don't do the RNA processing um, in anything. I mean, they there are exceptions, and it slows me down to think of all the exceptions while I'm talking, but the point is the vast majority of, of uh, bacteria won't do much RNA processing. So... Um, any anything that gets transcribed will presumably then get translated, um, and then there's some post-translational modification in bacteria also. But the main point here is to compare the size of these arrows. The vast majority of regulation in bacteria happens at the at transcription. So bacteria really control what proteins they have by deciding when to transcribe the genes that encode those proteins. Not really at any other step. They don't wait to translate a protein, they just translate it if there's a messenger RNA. They just do that, boom, they do it. Um, so it's really transcription that matters. And so when, when you study uh, bacterial genetics, you spend a lot of time looking at transcription. And that brings us to operons. And operons are an important um, an important genetic organization you see in um, in bacteria. This drawing here is meant to be DNA. It's meant to be the um, the chromosome, the bacterial chromosome. Uh, um, and the idea here is that they're showing you an operon. And if we were going to look at this in a lot of detail, each of these colored bands would have some kind of specific role in regulating transcription of this operon. So that's what the different colors are, and we're not going to really look at them in detail. Um, but I draw your attention to the green part. There are three different LAC um, words. These are the names of genes. This is how bacterial genes are named. They get a three-letter lowercase italicized. They get a three-letter italicized prefix, which usually says something about what pathway they're part of. So in this case, these three genes are involved, well, the, 
definitely these two are involved in lactose metabolism. This one is tangentially related to lactose metabolism. Um, but the reason they all have the same uh, first three letters is that they're transcribed together. They're part of the same system. Um, anyway, so a bacterial gene name is three letters um, and then one capital letter. And so they just, when they were naming this um, a long time ago, they came up with LAC, and then I don't know how they came up with these uppercase letters. It doesn't really matter. The point is, um, when you see italicized something like this, that's a bacterial gene. And so what we can notice here is we're looking at three different bacterial genes with no major divisions between them, no major space between them. So this might be, the lax Z gene is really big, it might be, off the top of my head, I don't know, but like 2,500 base pairs long. And the space between that one and this one might be only 25 base pairs. So um, there's not much space between them, and the idea is once transcription starts here at the transcription start site, it will just transcribe this entire three gene sequence and make one long messenger RNA. Um, and then all this stuff here is like regulatory sequences that control how, um, how often this is going to be transcribed. So this is the LAC operon, and um, I won't go into it in much detail. But the, the point of this is to help E. coli, which is the organism that has this, it's to help E. coli express the genes that let it metabolize lactose under the right conditions and not express those genes under other conditions. The reason that's important is that um, it takes a lot of energy to make proteins. It, it takes a lot of energy to do transcription. Um, and and it takes, yeah, a lot of like amino acids and stuff to make proteins. And so bacteria can't afford to make every protein all the time. So they're going to make them when they need them. And this is set up in a way that lets them do that. Um, so the first thing is when the right conditions happen, things happen here that will attract RNA polymerase, which will start doing transcription of the whole thing. And that will lead to one long messenger RNA that has all three genes. And each one has its own ribosome binding site at the beginning of it. And that ribosome binding site will attract a ribosome to initiate translation. Um, sorry, the, um, another point I want to make is that you, if you transcribe this gene, you definitely transcribe these two also, with exceptions. Um, but translation of these three genes is independent of each other. And so this one might have a ribosome binding site that strongly attracts ribosomes. And so it would be translated at a very high rate and you get lots of copies of the, um, of the protein, the lac -Z protein. Um, whereas this might have an intermediate amount and this might have a really weak um, ribosome binding site that leads to a very slow amount of translation and not very many copies. The last thing I want to show you on this slide is um, the way we write uh, protein names. The protein is named after the gene, but um, it's not italicized and it is capitalized. So those two changes help you keep track of whether we're looking at a gene or a protein. So um, this is a gene, lowercase italicized. This is a protein, uppercase not italicized. Okay, so that's an operon, and those come up from time to time, and I just want you to have a clear sense of what uh, they are. Next, we're going to start looking at mutations, and before we do that, I want to make sure we are all on the same page about um, translation and what that is. So, a mutation happens to DNA, and that becomes noticeable when that gene is expressed and some protein is made, because the protein can be different because of that mutation.
So just remember, and this is something you really should do again and again, is go back and visualize clearly a protein as a chain of amino acids where the different amino acids give different chemical um, characteristics. So some parts of the protein are going to have a negative charge, some will have a positive charge, some are going to be hydrophobic, some will be hydrophilic, and it's very specific to the job the protein has to do. And so what we're thinking about is um, mutations happen in the DNA. Well, how do they show up in the protein? And this is sort of the idea. Um, this is the genetic code. And on the messenger RNA, if we see like this sequence, these three in what we call the reading frame, um, the ribosome will incorporate a proline. If instead these were the three bases, it would instead incorporate histidine. I'm not going to do much with this um, in this course. I just want you to see this and remember the connection between DNA and amino acids. This is the connection. If the DNA sequence changes from CCU to CAU, the amino acid in that position changes from proline to histidine. And that's um, a type of mutation we could have. Um, likewise, we could look at other types of mutations. If CCU is mutated and becomes CCC, the amino acid doesn't change. And so the protein wouldn't be any different. There'd be no way of if you look at the protein, there's no way of knowing there was a mutation if the mutation was from this to this. So those are two types of mutations you could see. Another would be these stop codons. Whenever these stop codons are in incorporated, or whenever they show up in the messenger RNA, the ribosome falls off and stops extending the amino acid chain, stops adding new amino acids to it. So if if there were a mutation from UAU, or if it were DNA TAT, tyrosine, to UAA or TAA, instead of tyrosine, it would be the end of the um, protein. And you could imagine if this was in the middle of the protein, if this was in the very middle of the um, amino acid sequence, and you change it with a stop, you're cutting that, G that, that protein in half. And that could have, well, that almost certainly would completely inactivate the protein. So those are types of mutations. And this slide walks you through what I just walked you through, I think. Yes. I just want to make sure it's all written down here in case people aren't watching the videos or so that you can study without having to watch the videos all the time. Um, so these are the types of mutations. This is something you should know. Um, Partly because I want you to have to think through what the difference is between these types of mutations because it helps you visualize the genetics. And my goal is for you to understand mutations and evolution in bacteria um, so that you can understand things like antibiotic resistance or things like um, mutations happen in viruses too. And if you want to understand how uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is uh, changing, that's what we're learning here. So um, these are the types of mutations. And the ones I walked you through um, on the last slide were um, these three. First, I showed you a silent mutation. I think that was first where the DNA sequence changed, but the amino acid sequence didn't change. And then I showed you a missense mutation where the amino acid does change. And then I showed you a nonsense mutation. And that's what we call it when there's a stop signal created. Um, and then bigger changes could be insertions or deletions. Um, and these could do things like change the reading frame which can completely alter a protein and make it completely unrecognizable and useless. Um, and so on the next slide, we walk 
we can walk through this with this specific example where we see, okay, what's the normal sequence? Methionine, um, I think that's glycine. Yeah, methionine, glycine, threonine, serine, um, and then the stop codon. So this is like a super silly, short, super small protein. There are no proteins that I know of that are only four amino acids uh, that we would care about. But let's just imagine that this four amino acid protein had some critical function for the cell. There are three different base pair substitutions where one base changes. Three different ways that can happen or three different types. The silent mutation um, changes um, one of these bases from AGA to AAA, and that still is glycine. So glycine to glycine, and it's, it's green because they want to draw your attention to it, not because it's different. It's the same amino acid. So the, the cell doesn't know this happened. The cell has no, the cell doesn't care at all that this happened. A missense mutation could be a bigger deal because here, instead of AGA, it's AAG. Wait, I don't know. Um, whatever it is, you could imagine a base change that changes the amino acid. Does that matter for the protein? We don't know. We don't know how important that one amino acid was, and we don't know what the change is. If that amino acid was in the active site of that protein, like maybe it bound the molecule that it has to react with, or maybe it stabilized a chemical reaction in a way that makes it faster. And if it if it's like a positively charged amino acid because it's interacting with a negative charge on that molecule, and the mutation makes it a negatively charged amino acid, it's going to break the whole protein. Um, it's going to completely inactivate it because it's going to repel when it should be attracting. Um, but if you substitute one um, negatively charged amino acid for another, it's going to have a, probably a slight effect. And if it's not in the active site, it might have no effect. You never know. Um, so missense mutations can range from um, totally not noticeable to completely inactivating the protein. You just can't know until you look at it. And then a nonsense mutation puts a stop codon in um, and that ends the whole protein there. And so this would certainly destroy the function of that protein. Um, a little more harder to see are frame shift mutations. So if one base is removed here, what that does is shift all of these bases one over. And the ribosome, remember, is looking at this group, and then it's looking at these three, and then these three, and then these three, and then these three, and it's going to keep doing that. It's going to look at these three, then these three, then these three. But if there's a deletion and all of these shift over one, well, now, instead of ACA, it's CAU, because all of these shifted over one. So um, it's a it's a mess. Um, it's now a totally different amino acid, and that's called a frame shift. And insertions and deletions can both cause frame shifts. Um, if a frame shift happens early on in, um, in the gene, the entire protein is changed randomly. The entire protein is basically randomized. So an uh, insertion or deletion could potentially destroy a gene. So that's a good enough start with um, getting you thinking about uh, DNA, RNA, and protein. And that's really what I want you to do. Whenever you think about mutations or evolution, I want you to think about the connection between the DNA and the proteins and cells' behavior. So with that, let's stop this video and move on to the next one.